In the past days, Sieroji has been speaking about three kinds of deeds which purify one's existence, punya. And of these three, Sieroji has spoken about dana punya and sila punya, the purifying deeds of generosity and morality in a brief way. And uh, Sieroji said that if we perform dana in a thorough way, then the benefit that we gain is poga sampati, that is material fulfillment. Boga means material wealth. Uh, it also means things which we use, such as a living place, clothing, food, other, other useful material possessions. And dana brings this boga sampati, the fulfillment of fulfillment by way of material things. So when we are fulfilled with what we need materially, then we don't feel inferior in the world. We're able to help others because we have enough. We can also use our things ourselves without having to worry about what we're going to live on. And therefore, dana, this thorough systematic dana, makes it easy for us to avoid the things which should be avoided. It makes it easy for us to keep morality or sila. And so to the extent that one avoids actions harming others which should not be done, then our physical and verbal behavior become clean. And therefore in this life, uh, one who behaves like this is able to live free of danger. And in the next life too, living like this, keeping a, a life of, harm, of not harming others, one will gain a good life. And this is called bhava sampati, or fulfillment, with regard to one's existence. That means that one encounters good, good parents, good teachers, good friends. And in this way, one's um, morality becomes even better because one encounters these good, good companions, good teachers. And this is something Sieroji omitted yesterday. Furthermore, all beings are afraid of being harmed. All beings, as long as there's any tendency to anger in us, then fear can arise. So all beings are, are afraid of being killed, of being harmed. People are afraid of having their things stolen. They're afraid of having their daughters attacked. They're afraid of having their wives attacked, and so on. So. Um, but when we are able to keep good morality, I'm sorry, and furthermore, people are afraid of being lied to. You know, especially lies can destroy our reputation, they can destroy our business, our wealth. And people also fear actions done by people who are under the entire an intoxicating influence of drugs or alcohol. So all these types of actions that people fear are to be avoided. And if one avoids committing these sorts of misdeeds, either out of shame, moral shame and moral fear regarding doing these acts, or it can also be because of understanding how other people feel, feel uh, if they have to endure that type of thing. So how, whatever the cause is, uh, one avoids such actions. And when one does, then one gives others a gift too. And what it is is that other people don't need to be afraid 
of us harming them when we refrain from these types of misdeeds. So this too is a form of dana, and it's called giving the gift of fearlessness. Other people don't need to fear us when we keep sila. So when we give material things, this is called amisa dana or wutu dana, giving material things. But when we keep morality, there's no material thing involved. There's just the understanding that we shouldn't do these things, and so we avoid them. And in doing so, we give we give the gift of fearlessness. So, but most people in the world don't know about this gift of fearlessness. They don't know about the results that come from giving the gift of fearlessness and therefore the world is boiling with injustice. Because of keeping sila we get a human life. So having material things, being fulfilled with material things, are we happy? Physically we're not because in this day and age There are so many types of disease. And mentally, there are many types of problems that come into our lives. Individual problems, uh, problems within our family, problems within our work. And all the problems that we experience are difficult to fix. So when we live among all these types of problems, can can we possibly get uh, ease physically and mentally? Can we get mental and physical happiness? Is the type of happiness that we do get a guaranteed happiness, a happiness which lasts? When we do dana in a systematic way, we get material benefits. So we don't feel inferior among others. And when we keep sila, then we don't lose the happiness of being human. We don't lose out on the happiness of having a decent life. But if we get a new lifetime, what happens in that lifetime is, although we want to be young, we get old, Although we want to be healthy, we get sick. Although we don't want to leave, we have to die. And the people around us, uh, someone in our family may be sick, someone in our family may experience problems. That also makes us suffer. Uh, At times, uh, when we're ill, we don't have any way to make a uh, living and so we suffer because of that. Or among our family, one person and another, among our work, one person and another don't get along. So we can shed a lot of tears because of the problems that come up. So when we look at this, where does the suffering of our lifetime come from? Where does the suffering involved in this new life come from? It comes from the fact that we have a new existence. In every new existence, we're going to have these problems. And on the other hand, if there's no new lifetime for us, then these problems die down. So the Buddha sought for, he searched for this type of happiness that was free of any new lifetime. And he found it. So dana gives the happiness of material things. And sila gives the happiness of having a a lifetime in a good realm, in good conditions. But the happiness that dana and sila bring cannot be compared at all 
to the happiness the Buddha found that involves not having any new lifetime. That happiness is far, far greater, incomparably greater. Sieroji mentioned uh, yesterday and other days that dana needs to be done in a way that it is not tainted with unwholesomeness. It should be done with, with wholesome mental attitudes. And he also mentioned that um, how sila is like a mouth. And only when we have a good mouth to, um, to eat with will we be able to take in nourishment. And our tongue also has to be good because if we don't have a tongue that is healthy and capable of tasting, it will be very boring to eat. Even if we have something to eat, with no, when, when, when we don't experience taste, then eating is no fun at all. So we should have this foundation of sila that is like our mouth for taking in nourishment. It is the basis for what we are doing and it is very important. In human beings, the mouth is important for taking in food and drink. Without a mouth, we can't put in food and drink. And if we have a mouth that has sores on it or that has an injury, then it makes it difficult to eat. But if our mouth is healthy and good, then we can put food in into our bodies and the nourishment that comes from the food spreads throughout our being and we get the benefit of this. Clean, pure behavior is called kusala. Clean, pure physical behavior, clean, pure speech, clean, pure mentality. And for this Kusala, these clean, pure uh, body, speech, and mind to come about in us, our sila must be good. So we need this mouth of sila if we're going to put in the food of mental cleanliness and development of knowledge. So to the extent that we are able to nourish ourselves with mental cleanliness and with developing knowledge, then we will get sukha sampati, or fulfillment of happiness. So it is said in the text that the purifying deed of bhavana, bhavana punya, is the cause for happiness. So for people who don't like to suffer and like happiness, should undertake this practice. And those who practice with faith, respectfully and carefully, can get the very beginnings of happiness in just a few days. The cause for this happiness is none other than the practice the yogis are doing right now, the practice of Satipatthana. First, with satipatthana, one's mind becomes clean and joyous interest arises, piti. One feels satisfied. And when one starts to see the nature of the Dhamma, then one gains an unrelinquishable happiness, a happiness that never gets old. Continuing to practice, one develops knowledge and gains a happiness that is peaceful. So those who, for those who aim for this type of happiness, so that they can be free of danger while undertaking the practice, Seroji will speak about the four guardian meditations, Chattu Araka. Bhavana. These are meditations that are traditionally taught as a way of protection. 
in the word chatu araka bhavana chatu means four and araka means protection or guardian when we do an important task it's important to have protection and the more important task the task is the more important it is to be protected so the four protective meditations that we do are one buddha nusati which is the recollection of one of the qualities of the buddha second is metta meditation this is developing the wish for other beings that they be well happy asubha bhavana is looking at one's own body in terms of parts as hair of the head hair of the body nails teeth skin in order that it not seem attractive we divide it up into parts and examine it and fourth is marana sati recollection of the fact of death basically that one will die before long this is not in order to make people afraid of death human beings can die at any time the reason the buddha prescribed doing this meditation is that so that one will be urged to do this important work before one dies before it's too late so these four meditations are what one must develop but not uh, to spend a whole lot of time with these one should do these four meditations for about 5 minutes before one sits about two or three times a day among these four types of meditation the word buddha nusati is made up of buddha and anusati buddha of course means the buddha and anusati means repeated recollection remembering repeatedly so the buddha has many qualities and the first of his special qualities is arahang this means pure of f- completely clean free of defilement the buddha didn't have even a little bit of greed or anger or delusion much less extreme greed hatred or delusion he was completely clean of these mental defilements of any mental defilements whenever he encountered something that was enticing lovely capable of causing greed greed didn't arise in him whenever he encountered something hateful no hatred arose in him whenever he encountered anything that was confusing confusion didn't arise in him whatever he wanted to put his mind on he could know that thing so he the buddha was free of mental defilements he had none at all and because of this cleanliness he was respected by those around him he had the quality of being worthy of respect this came from his purity and the buddha taught the three trainings so that each of us in our own capacity to our own capacity could become clean too so if we practice these trainings we can become clean and to the extent that one is clean then one's environment uh, one will be free of ridicule from one's environment this is quite good and uh, once those around one will will pay attention and take care of one so the benefit is when we develop the uh, rec- recollection of the buddha's qualities that when we practice sometimes we can see something frightening or we might hear something frightening and 
these things won't uh, make us fearful during our practice. We won't have, we won't tend to encounter these fearful things, or fear will not arise because we are doing this recollection of the Buddha's quality in advance before anything can happen. So this is a quality that we should reflect on one of the Buddha's special qualities as a protection. Here at this retreat, there are people from all backgrounds, people from all over the world. And although uh, there's no one from a Muslim background, as far as we know, um, there are people from Christian backgrounds, Hindu, people who don't have any religion, and so on. So um, for people who don't have, for people who find it hard to have faith in an, in an individual, the Buddha was an individual person. So if one feels it's hard to put one's trust in an individual, then one should turn to the Dhamma and reflect on one of the qualities of the Dhamma that is svakato bhagavata dhammo. The Dhamma is that which bears the one who practices the Dhamma. That's the meaning of the word Dhamma. And svakata means that what it, the practice and the results it brings match exactly. And an example of what is meant by this is, for example, if we practice sila, a human being should avoid killing. Okay. So we may undertake this because of shame and fear, or we may undertake this because we feel how other people feel. We have a, we have a sympathetic feeling. And whether it's because of our, our hiri otapa, our shame and fear regarding misdeeds, or because of our understanding how other people feel, if we avoid killing, then we don't commit something that is physically defiling. We don't uh, commit this type of gross misdeed and other people are not harmed. So in avoiding killing, we protect others and we preserve our own morality. Another example of how the practice and the result it brings fit exactly is that when we put our mind on the abdomen to observe the rising and the falling, and our mind sticks to the abdomen, our mind sticks to the rising and follows it every second, sticks to the following every second, then there's no way we're going to commit any physical acts. These, uh, the tendencies don't even arise in our mind. This, these, the practice of watching the rising and the falling, trying to do that, every second of the time, making the mind stick to it, prevents defilements from arising on a mental level. So this is the result that is gained. And this is what is meant by svakata, that the results are consistent with the practice. So for people who find it a burden to believe in the Buddha, then please reflect on this quality of the Dhamma. Another quality that is described of the Dhamma, so Sayadaji said that people who have no religion or people who do, for wh whoever it is, uh, the Dhamma is matter of cause and effect. It's natural. So we should be able to accept reflecting on the qualities of the Dhamma. And one way, another way the qualities of the Dhamma are described 
is that the Dhamma is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. To say it's good in the beginning means that for some people, people who have faith, people who want to develop a clean mind and knowledge, just on hearing the Dhamma, their minds become calm and the heat goes down. To say that it's good in the middle is that when we practice it, it brings happiness. For example, when we practice sila, we get fulfillment in terms of our life. When we practice satipatthana, observing the arising object, kilesas are eliminated. And when concentration and knowledge develop stage by stage, if finally we gain the peaceful happiness that comes at the end of the practice, we will understand how the Dhamma is good in the end. So the Buddha described the Dhamma as Adi Kalyana, that means good in the good in the beginning. Just on hearing it, one starts to be calm and peaceful. Madje Kalyana, that means that it's good to the extent we practice it, we gain, we know its goodness. Paryosana Kalyana, Paryosane Kalyana, that means that when we gain the peaceful happiness at the end, it's also good. So the Dhamma, good in the start, good in the middle, and good in the end. So one can compare with one's own experience and see. So knowing the correct method for making our life better is very important. Everyone wants to be a true human. Everyone wants to have a human heart, human mentality. Everyone wants to gain better than average human knowledge. So everyone, this means whether one has a religion or not, this practice is something that concerns one. An, an analogy is breathing fresh air. Breathing fresh air is something that relates to all of us. It's something that's important to all of us. No one can live without it. If we breathe in air that is polluted, how will we feel? We might get sick, we might die from it. And if we don't breathe air at all, we can just try holding our breath and see how long we can stand it. So. Fresh air is something that we all need. And true mental cleanliness, too, is something that all of us need. It, need. This method for developing a pure mind and knowledge is relevant, meaningful for everyone. When we keep sila, it's like we breathe in fresh air. And when we practice satipatthana, it's like breathing in even fresher air. This dhamma is relevant for everyone, not just for Buddhists. One should understand this. So in these two months, knowing the correct method, if one applies oneself, in one month of careful practice, one can see this will change one's life, let alone in two months. So it's very important what the yogis do on their side. The second guardian meditation is metta, loving, loving kindness. This is wanting others to be happy wanting others to be healthy, to be fulfilled in all ways. If when we look at another person or a group and we focus on what we don't like, 
if we focus on the bad things, then we'll get angry. And because of anger, our mind gets hot and we suffer. And this can affect, uh, affect us physically. So if in place of anger, we insert loving kindness, metta, then we'll, we'll feel satisfied when we look at another person and we won't suffer. So it's really not about their happiness as much as it is about our own happiness. So when we, um, when we ex develop metta, we express the wish that people be free of danger and enemies. And in Burmese, the word is yan. In Pali, the word is wear up. And there are two kinds of these dangers or enemies. One is the internal enemy, which is akusala, unwholesome deeds, speech, mentality, or kilesas, mental defilements. And the other is pugala, wera, the, the enemy that is outside of us, the personal enemy. So akusala, or kilesas, mental defilements, occur within us. And how they occur is that when we see something that we like, then we have greed, and then we give in to our greed, and we commit wrong deeds. We, had, we harm someone, we lie, we commit adultery, and so on. Or seeing something one doesn't like, there's anger, and we give in to the anger and commit misdeeds. Or out of not knowing, we commit acts like killing, stealing, because we don't know that it's wrong. So these types of misdeeds, the akusala and kilesa, these burn us. The enemy in the form of a person, pugala vera, is something that we don't encounter very often. So for one who is not moral, the internal enemy is always assaulting one. So it's very important to eliminate this internal enemy. In the world, those who know that the internal enemy is the most fearful are very few. So if one doesn't know to avoid gross misdeeds, if one doesn't know how to control the unwholesomeness that exists in a moderate level, if one doesn't know how to uproot the refined level of unwholesomeness of kilesas, then one won't be able to control these unwholesome tendencies. And not being able to control them, one will commit misdeeds. So as a result of the internal enemy, dangers arise. And the first of these is that when one commits an immoral deed, when one remembers it, one blames oneself. One says, oh, I did that. I'm so bad. Why did I do that? So that's the first danger that comes our way when we, uh, when we let the internal enemy attack us. And the second danger is that those around us will also criticize one, blame us because of that, of committing immoral acts. That is called paranuvada beya. And then if the wrong that we did involves breaking the law, then we'll be subject to prosecution. We'll, we'll be subject to punishment under the law. And one can go to jail for a long time. So this is Danda Beya. And when one looks at one's life, if one has committed immoral deeds, 
then one sees one li- one's life doesn't look very good. And the next one is also not going to look very good. This is the danger of rebirth in a bad realm, dugati baya. So as long as we are not able to put down the internal enemy, these four dangers can arise, will arise. When we develop loving kindness, we, in Pali, we say avera hontu, and this is commonly translated as may, may people may may they be free of danger. But what we are really saying is, may all beings be able to put down the internal enemy. May all beings be free of the dangers that arise because of the internal enemy. When we can develop metta, it's very good. The remaining two types of guardian meditations will be mentioned, talked about tomorrow. <clears throat>